So hi, my name is Steve Kalesser. I'm with Gracie and Harrigan Consulting Foresters, and we're the consulting foresters for the Hudson Farm Club. Uh, the Hudson Farm Club uh, controls about 3,600 acres uh, here in southern Sussex County. Uh, that spans er everywhere from about uh, Andover Borough, Andover Township, uh, up to Sparta, and all the way down here to, to where we are in Hopatcong Borough. Um, the, uh, uh, the forest land that they hold is approximately 3,000 acres of forest land, very similar to uh, much of the other forest land that we have here in Sussex County, uh, mostly um, maturing upland oak uh, with a very, very strong mid-story of northern hardwood trees coming up underneath, and many of the other challenges that, that we have here in New Jersey as far as uh, invasive species, uh, non-native invasive plants in particular, um, deer damage, and uh, um, new uh, invasive species, insect and disease problems. Today, as we're hosted here by Hudson Farm Club, uh, we're going to see many things that are related to their long-term uh, stewardship plans uh, here on the property in terms of what they're doing as far as wildlife habitat improvement, uh, forest stand improvement, uh, in terms of diversifying age classes on the property, and making sure that we're maintaining the forest as a forest over the long term. Uh, this has uh, many different um, applications as far as uh, forest carbon uh, and retention and, uh, and uh, showing resiliency of the forest to uh, hold and uh, continue to capture carbon, uh, deer, and also management of uh, endangered species populations. Hello. I am Andy Kim, president of the New Jersey Forestry Association, and we are here today at Hudson Farm Club in Apatcong, New Jersey. Uh, one of the things you will see today, many of the things you will see today, are the wonderful activities that have been performed on this property to promote forest stewardship and, and uh, help with wildlife management, preserve some of the wildlife, reintroduce re, uh, some of the wildlife that is part of New Jersey uh, the, as forests change, the wildlife changes. So we will be uh, led today by Steve Kalesser from the uh, firm of Gracie Harrigan Forestry Consultants, and you'll be able to see all of the fine things that they have done. Woodland owners have many prescriptions that they can perform on their properties. One of the unique things about the Hudson Farm Club is that they do many things, uh, many more than most woodland owners are going to do on their own. So you will see many of the things that you can do on your own property and uh, see the results as well as the activity that is performed. So thank you, welcome for joining us, and have a great day. So here we are at Hudson Farm. Uh, we're in an area where we did a, um, a seed tree harvest. Uh, some would call it a, um, a variable retention harvest about 2015. And prior to the harvest, uh, this area was um, agricultural fields probably a good 80 years ago. Uh, that was dominated by uh, red maple, black birch with uh, lots of oak, uh, also some um, uh, big tooth aspen, some hickory. And this was an area that uh, we had planned and done some uh, uh, preliminary work uh, to set the stage to do this uh, seed tree harvest in order to benefit uh, young forest uh, species. Uh, such as ruffed grouse and golden wing warbler. Uh, and that um, harvest was done in about 2015 over the winter. And what you see is uh, the results uh, from that. Uh, these are um, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, large tooth aspen, uh, oak, uh, red maple, black birch, cherry, uh, a very nice amount of uh, staghorn sumac, which is lovely to see in New Jersey, as well as some, uh, uh, some uh, American chestnut that was uh, planted by the landowner. Um, we started seeing um, 
success almost right after uh, uh, after cutting uh, in that the uh, big tooth aspen uh, suckered almost immediately uh, some of it had uh, had grown 12 foot just in the first year um, but uh, what you see behind us is a combination of both um, sprouting of um, uh, the stumps of what was cut uh, as well as seedling origin stock you can see it's very very dense uh, well above uh, deer browse height and uh, was, was past deer browse height probably within about three or four years of cutting. So a common question that I get as a forester is how can I manage my woods um, to meet a certain number of objectives if some of those objectives disagree with each other? Uh, I want to make sure that I have um, habitat for red-shouldered hawk on my property, but I also want to make sure that I have habitat for wood turtle and rough grouse, let's say. Um, well, not every objective has to be met on the same acre. All right. This is easier to understand on a property that's this large, um, but it can be even done on properties that are significantly smaller. So this is why consulting foresters will look at different areas of each property differently. Uh, wetlands and stream corridors often will look at managing one way and capturing many of the objectives that relate to water quality or um, reptile and amphibian habitat management in those areas. Look at certain upland areas in different ways. Areas that are closer to the house, closer to public roads, areas that are closer off, um, and manage them looking to meet the different objectives of the owner in different places. So as long as those objectives can be met on a total property, it doesn't matter that some of them do conflict. Not every objective has to be met on the exact same acre. So as we mentioned before, the Hudson Farm Club properties are about 3,600 acres, of which about 3,000 acres is forested. What you see around you right now is the typical forested stand at the Hudson Farm property. Um, it's pretty remarkable that the, uh, the vast majority of this property is almost exactly the same. We have some very large hickory, we have lots of oak, and then underneath it we have something completely different. We have tons of sugar maple, red maple, black birch, some black gum. Um, and what this is showing us is that while that overstory is uh, an extremely desirable forest cover, what happens during the next natural disturbance? What happens during the next Hurricane Sandy? What happens during the next, uh, after the next microburst? All right, they're gonna be filled in by these sugar maple, these red maple, and we're gonna have this conversion from oak hickory, which is extremely desirable for, for, for all manner of wildlife, everything from bear, deer, turkey, all the way down to songbirds reliant on that hard mast, especially the acorns, okay? And replaced by something where it has a, 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 a much less uh, of a wildlife uh, uh, value in terms of those same species. Uh, certain studies have shown that uh, elimination of oak within a forest stand uh, uh, could drop avian diversity by 50%. So, um, the, uh, the way that uh, Hudson Farm and probably the vast majority of the Forestry Association's members manage that is through forest stand improvement, where we're retaining uh, 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 many of these largest trees that we want to keep, the oaks, the hickory, some of the other uh, uh, high wildlife value trees, um, by cutting some of these smaller uh, uh, black birch, red maple, sugar maple out from underneath it. 
this does two things. Uh, 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 most importantly for, for, for me as a forester is that it's opening up more sunlight down to the forest floor uh, so we can get some oak seedlings hopefully eventually turning into oak saplings which will then be the next uh, 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 generation of the forest coming up underneath so that way when there is the next Hurricane Sandy, when there is the next microburst, that's what's going to fill in and we're going to keep that uh, forest canopy uh, uh, as the same forest cover type. Uh, second thing is that it's going to improve the forest for certain wildlife. All right, um, this is a 3,000 acre property. Um, well, why aren't there redhead, redheaded woodpeckers all over it? Yeah, there might be a few here and there, but extreme, they're extremely limited on the property. All right, um, and the big reason for that is that they just can't exist in a forest stand that has this mid-story. All right, when I say mid-story, I'm not talking about the overstory that's 100 foot tall in most of these places. I'm talking about everything from about 40 to 20 foot tall growing underneath that. When you have a forest stand that's that cluttered up, a lot of times it's a negative for a lot of our endangered species. Not all of them, but definitely some of them. One of the other common questions we get is, can forest management uh, work well uh, in a, um, uh, a carbon sensitive environment? Um, and in terms of forest stand improvement, like what we saw before, uh, I think the answer is clearly yes, uh, because um, we're working with cutting trees that in in many ways would die out on their own. Uh, so we're not really impacting the amount of carbon that would be entering the system uh, 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 from any real perspective. Um, and then in terms of more intensive management, like what you see here in, in uh, uh, this area where we harvested and then did prescribed burning, um, we look at it from the perspective of um, what products were made out of the trees that were harvested. Uh, and in this specific area, uh, we're happy to say that, that almost all of the high quality wood in, in this particular area uh, went into long-lived forest products. Uh, think furniture, think cabinetry, think uh, sashes for windows. Um, so these are forest products that are going to are going to be a long, around for a long, long time. And in terms of the lower quality wood, uh, what wasn't left here to recycle into the soil and uh, maintain the soil fertility, uh, a lot of that went to uh, uh, firewood uh, for displacing. Uh, 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 fossil fuels uh, such as home heating oil uh, uh, or even sometimes natural gas. Uh, so in this, in this way, uh, 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 this isn't a direct addition uh, uh, into, the, um, uh, into the carbon, into the, into the atmosphere. It's being stored, continued to be stored, uh, uh, but not necessarily as trees, but as either long-lived forest products or by displacing uh, 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 fuel oil uh, that would be burned for home heat. All right, so here we are at the edge of an area where we had uh, conducted a prescribed burn, or uh, rather the New Jersey Forest Fire Service had con uh, conducted a prescribed burn. Um, and the, the area where most of the burn happened uh, was an area where we had uh, conducted a very heavy harvest, uh, seed tree, um, uh, modified seed tree harvest back in 2013-2014. Um, now that area grew back uh, uh, very well, very, very very thick with trees and uh, this area um, was uh, specifically for uh, young forest birds. Uh, so think uh, ruffed grouse, um, uh, American woodcock, uh, uh, golden-winged warbler, 
and the area, believe it or not, grew back uh, too thick with trees. Uh, so at a certain point, uh, as the trees got a little bit bigger, uh, it was decided that we would conduct a prescribed burn here, and that held uh, 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 really two, two purposes. Uh, first was to sort of thin uh, out some of the uh, maple and birch uh, uh, that was growing through here uh, while retaining the oak. Uh, and the second was for wildlife purposes to uh, get a little bit more uh, of the way of grasses and goldenrods into this area uh, and that would help some of the ground nesting birds uh, while still keeping a lot of the um, uh, native blueberry and sweet fern and a lot of the other um, uh, uh, woody native species that we have here. Uh, so. Behind me are some of the char marks over here, and as we uh, move through this area, we'll take a look at, uh, at some more. Um, prescribed fire uh, isn't everybody's cup of tea. Uh, uh, most of our practice is in North Jersey, and uh, uh, prescribed fire isn't something that most of our clients are, are, are even vaguely interested in, uh, although a lot of our friends down in the Pine Barrens would, would think differently. Um, and even amongst them, it's a matter of, okay, well, you know, uh, uh, are people interested in prescribed burn for some of the wildlife benefits? Are they interested in it in um, uh, uh, fuel hazard reduction benefits? Well, these are conversations to have uh, with your forester and to, to take a look at the property and its current conditions and how you want to see it in the future. And uh, uh, that's something that uh, it should be a point of discussion with your forester as you're drawing up your forest management plan. The typical large tree, visualize it in your head, whether it's the tree that's growing right outside your house, the tree that you have uh, your tree stand on, right? Picture that tree in your mind. Think of how big it is. Think about how tall it is. Think about how much wood is in that tree, all right? Possibly several tons of wood in a, in a single large tree. Now consider that well over 99% of the volume of that tree came from the thin air. All of the wood in that tree, vast, vast majority of that, is carbon dioxide that was once in the atmosphere. That's been turned into cellulose that's now in that tree. These young trees here are very early in that process of soaking up that carbon dioxide. And they're pulling it in, they're pulling it in, they're pulling it in, and they're pulling it in. So that when you see a young forest, even a slightly older forest, 20, 30 year, year old forest, it's pulling in a remarkable amount of carbon dioxide out of the forest. So when I see a young forest that's developing well, that's turning into a small pole-sized forest, and even a little bit further on, you're talking about a forest that's really doing its best to function as a carbon sink, pulling that carbon dioxide, turning into wood, and locking it up, taking it out of the atmosphere. So as the other foresters watching this video know, we get a lot of questions from forest landowners and from members of the public who are very interested in forests. And that's, that's great. It shows a, a big interest in forests and keeping our forests around and green. Uh, but I like to ask one certain question of, of people who ask me questions, and that's, well, what do you think the most valuable product is? that leaves a forested property. And some will say veneer, you know, you could have, uh, you know, veneer is, is, is extremely high value. You could have, you know, you could get, you know, a thousand, even up to two thousand dollars out of a single tree of veneer if it's exceptionally large, exceptionally clear. And some people think about it and they'll say, well, you know, if you calculate out the value of wildlife, you know, in terms of uh, economic productivity and everything like that, you know, that's, uh, 
uh, that's pretty pretty valuable. And uh, you know, my answer to that question, I think uh, you know, uh, uh, most people when they think about this will share that opinion, is that uh, clean water is the most valuable product that leaves a forest. Um, as a, as a as a forester, you know, not just working for the firm that I work for or uh, with the Hudson Farm as a client, um, but really this is true for 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 you know all of uh, all of our foresters here in the state and uh, for for members of the Society of American Foresters across the nation is that if what we're doing is having a meaningful impact on on uh, on water. Um, we 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 tend to, to put on the brakes and uh, rethink things, and we're exceptionally lucky here in New Jersey to have um, really incredible partners in the New Jersey Forest Service uh, who develop our um, forestry and wetlands best management practices and ensure that um, uh, uh, everybody practicing forestry here in New Jersey are following those best management practices and doing everything possible to conserve and protect water quality.